Well, hey there, and welcome to an exciting new episode of Show Me the Crypto. This week, we chat with Joel Valenzuela about the fact that he's been living solely off of cryptocurrency since 2015. Ulf, your thoughts? We got to, this is the first time we've spoke to someone who's living solely off crypto. Most people we talk to and deal with are, you know, they're either building in the space or they're investing or trading or it's NFTs or whatever it is, but they're not usually living day to day with crypto. So it was a super interesting conversation to learn about all the challenges that come with that, but also all the ways it's made Joel's life better, at least better for him, what he wants to get out of life. And so to learn some of the technical challenges in dealing with merchants and what cryptos does he use to make purchases day to day? How does he pay for his bills? All of that stuff was super fascinating to me. And to hear it from someone who's very passionate about it still after been after he's been doing it for so long um, and facing those challenges, he still wouldn't change a thing. And I think that was so interesting. Yeah. And as Ulf says, Joel got into the logistics of how do you do this? How do you live a life fully on crypto? He walked us through different layers of to some level how you can do it. But we also talked about Joel's upbringing. I mean, this guy has a fascinating background, grew up on a cattle farm. He worked at the White House. Then he got introduced to Bitcoin. A fascinating story. We hope you enjoy this episode. Show me the crypto. <laughs> Show me the crypto. <laughs> Show me the crypto. In a world on the brink of disruption, two men will bring you clarity by interviewing some of the most intelligent and influential names in the blockchain world. Welcome to Show Me the Crypto with your hosts, Wade Patterson and Ulf Lonegren. Well, hi there and welcome to Show Me the Crypto. My name is Wade Patterson. And I'm Ulf Lonegren. We're a couple of friends from Canada who love learning about cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology, and we're happy you're along for the ride. Whether you're a crypto virgin or you know your way around the block, we hope our interviews with some of the most intelligent and influential people in the blockchain space help deliver you with value. And on this episode, we're joined by Joel Valenzuela, a libertarian content creator who has been living solely on crypto for the past eight years years. From being brought up on a cattle farm to working at the White House to moving to New Hampshire for the Free State Project, Joel's diverse background led him to the blockchain space where he has become a respected journalist and educator. Through this conversation, we're hoping to understand what it truly takes to live off of crypto. Joel, welcome to Show Me the Crypto. Hey, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, it's quite quite the intro. I'm sure some people would dispute the respected part, depending on <laughs> which corner which corner of Twitter you're on. But yeah, I disagree, man. I think you're hugely respected. And we were joking before we hit the record button of, you know, we've done 120 some odd episodes of this. And I think you are the first person who is truly 100% living off of crypto. So huge respect for that alone. But where I want to start the conversation, Joel, is that... In researching for the pod, one thing kind of came apparent, and that was that obviously you're kind of on the bleeding edge of using this mm -hmm. new technology, but perhaps that your parents were a little bit on the bleeding edge as well. So first off as Silicon Valley yuppies, then utilizing solar panels on a cattle farm when nobody was using solar panels. So I'm just curious, that own ability to be on the bleeding edge. Is that something that comes a little bit from your upbringing and from your parents? Yeah, I guess, um, I guess if I were to be perfectly honest, it's, it's two things. It's first off, it's made me a lot more comfortable and not, not feel the aversion to doing something radically different, but also it's just the discomfort in doing something normal where, um, you know, difficulty fitting into normal ways of life and stuff being the weird, weird homeschooled nerd from, you know, the middle of nowhere, but also, you know, raised as a, a weird intellectual one of sorts and just kind of perfect for, you know, where I ended up, I guess. But yeah, it's a, it's definitely, I'm definitely a product of my past, but um, where I ended up is obviously a product of my choices. And yeah, 
that's that's I guess the way I could encapsulate the whole thing. Speaking of being a product of your past, you have an interesting timeline. Your your background started on a cattle farm. You ended up working at the White House. You heard about Bitcoin in 2011. You moved to New Hampshire, dived deeper into crypto, and at some point started living solely on crypto. Can you, that's the like very high level version that I'm aware <laughs> of, but can you sort of break down that timeline in a little more detail, maybe highlighting some of those key points along your way? Yeah. So to start with the, the very early upbringing part, um, my parents were Silicon Valley yuppies. My dad was a, programmer at Hewlett Packard in the punch card days. So I guess that kind of got my my tech blood kind of going at an early age. And my mother was a, a journalist, which again also seems to be hereditary a little bit. Uh, but at some point, I mean, I think the state of San Francisco today is something that's very well documented, very well known, that is kind of a place in decay. And I think that the warning signs were there in the late 80s, early 90s where it was the pinnacle. And uh, it's something that's kind of a, a common theme. Um, it's kind of like a lot of the things that I've done in my life aren't really that exceptional. They just are a little earlier than a lot of people have done them, right? And so now it's become very trendy to talk about, oh, the big city is terrible, the big city life. Let's just move to the farm for a quality life and to get away from the hordes of zombies and needles on the ground and everything like that. And so... It was kind of like a an early version of that to kind of get out there. And then um, pretty much as far as I remember in my education, um, I got into, I was very fascinated with, um, as they called it, um, political economy, which is basically public policy, politics, and economics. And it's kind of, in a certain sense, the science of making the world a better place. And that's one thing why economics kind of gets a bad rap from a lot of mainstream sectors because they think it's just, oh, high level money finance stuff. But it's really if you want a society to thrive, there's certain rules and conditions that make it thrive better and some that are worse. And something I was acutely aware of growing up on mo both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border, seeing people sometimes the exact same people succeed on one side of this imaginary line and not so much on the other side. It made me think about like, why is that? What are the conditions for a better, freer, more prosperous world? And so I always cared about that. My career went into public policy at first and a whole bunch of think tanks and things like that and did the whole DC scene. And eventually um, I kind of migrated to New Hampshire is part of this thing called the Free State Project um, to and got into crypto as as a kind of way of um, sort of like a return to origin sort of a thing, like go out, see the world, but then also understand that the epicenters of power is not where the good life is. It's not where you make change either. And so all that sort of led if you think about my where I am right now, it's all these disparate bits of my life do make 100% sense as far as you know i live in a very small uh, community in new hampshire but the house is completely heated by wood that i chopped all year you know just still kind of semi on the farm um still you know with a tech background kind of thing still doing um what i consider to be public policy freedom work just in a very niche kind of area of um, cryptocurrency right now instead but i still think that that's like one of the biggest if not the biggest i probably the biggest front line of freedom in in the world and then at what point did you kind of decide okay i'm gonna live fully on crypto and logistically how did you set yourself up for success in that yeah i guess success is a little bit of a <laughs> well, it's a it's a depending on people's definitions, but um, basically the story of um, I'm not a very patient person, and I don't I try to just take action on things that I care about. Like, oh, I want that, you know, 
let me pursue that. Let me get that as soon as I can. Not I'm not good at accepting the world to be in an, an inferior state the way it is. I want to move it forward. And so um, as soon as I learned about, you know, money and economics and stuff in my early mid teens, um, I always, you know, heard about the history of money, the, the gold standard, things like that, getting on, getting rid of that and fiat currency and all the problems. And everyone I spoke to about this, who believed sort of the same things, who had the same knowledge base, seemed to be in a fatalistic kind of mindset of like, yeah, we all know that the central banking system is out of control. We all know that uh, it would be better to have a you know actual scarce sound money, but what are you going to do about it? It's not even like, well, we got this policy initiative that over the next five to 10 years, I think we could really achieve this through certain targeted model legislation or no, there's none of that. It just, meh. and that wasn't good enough for me. And so I do remember in 2011, 2012, um, trying to find a way to, because you, anyone can buy and invest in precious metals, for example, but to actually use them in day-to-day life, um, it's something that really doesn't happen ever these days. Uh, there is a small company, uh, I believe, out of New Hampshire that creates something called gold backs, which are little paper. Well, there there's certain um, notes, kind of like bank notes, that have a certain amount of gold that people do actually trade at a few, a few merchants around here. But for the most part, uh, it was Peter Schiff's bank at the time, and his um, he had a gold back debit card that I was trying to get because I was like, oh, what if I got to just live all on gold? This is great. Which you know now sounds a little bit silly, but in retrospect, that was the best that there was at the time. And then um, I heard about this thing called the Free State Project, where people were actually making a difference in in a place. And I decided to move up. And on the way over, as I've told quite many times, uh, uh, a friend paid for his part of the pizza in Bitcoin. So I had my own personal Bitcoin pizza day. And after uh, just a few times of transacting and just seeing. Oh wow, this is like digital cash. This is great stuff. That kind of sold me because this was pre-Venmo. There was none of those pay payment apps. It was just bank accounts and cards and making a transfer was really annoying. And just seeing this, like, oh, you don't have to do an account, you don't have to sync accounts, you just like scan a QR code, send, and anyone can do this. This and I was just like, this is it. This is this is what I want to do for a while. And where that just transitioned to living all off of crypto was over the next couple of years. I kept on like advocating for this, talking about this, and I kind of got uncomfortable with the idea that I'm telling people to do this thing that I don't really fully understand. So I thought, what if I fully understood it? What if I decided to just live on this stuff to use it all the time and see where that gets us? And then, I mean, after you make that decision, it just kind of like momentum. It's not like, well, let me think, am I going to go back and ask for my bank account back or whatever? It's like, it's hard to go back after that. So that's kind of where I'm at now. When it comes to day-to-day life with crypto, there's all kinds of questions we could come up with and all kinds of challenges that that come to mind. Um, like there's the more technical side of it in regards to can a merchant, you know, even accept crypto and that sort of stuff. But I'm more interested in the sort of like the value side of it. Meaning most people who buy crypto, I feel like there's a tendency to not want to spend it because for a lot of people, it's an investment tool or they're buying it and hoping it will go up. Or even if that's not the case, even if they did want to spend it, there's fear on the other end around, well, you know, if if I buy it and the value goes down and I spend it, I'm now spending money that has dropped in value. And on the flip side, if it goes up, I'm now spending money and therefore I have less sort of in my account that could be earning or growing in value. So how do you deal with the price fluctuations of a crypto asset like Bitcoin or I know you're a Dash advocate or whatever Mm -hmm. it may be? You know, how do you deal with that, all the volatility when you're doing day to day life purchases? Yeah, well, first for the um, something that's it's a really simple thing, but a lot of people don't even think about it is um, they have if they are say all in on Bitcoin or whatever, which usually means like 50% of their wealth or something, or maybe 80%, whatever, 
they still have this big pot of fiat currency in a bank account or something like that that they use to spend for day-to-day things. And for some reason, when they think about spending this, they they think that they have to spend from the stash and that they can't have a spending stash too. So you can, if you just have a, you know, just have more and then you could spend that and then you'll have the same amount of savings crypto as otherwise you would. Uh, as far as the uh, fluctuations, um, the fluctuations are a little, you know, they're not super dramatic on a day-to-day basis. You know, they, they do exist, but they're not dramatic on a day-to-day basis. Sometimes they, in, in fact, historically, they fluctuate upward as far as the space itself is concerned as a whole, more than downward. And so basically, if you spend when it's high and you don't spend when it's low, kind of, with obviously when you have bills, you have to pay those. As long as you operate under that kind of a, under that kind of a situation, things do tend to work out. Uh, It depends on, you know, people's level of like officialness, but uh, there are like tax loss harvesting strategies that people can do for their business or their their personal finances, where if you spend when it's down, you like that because then you get to write off a capital loss and pay pay the, the monster that is the government a little bit less money. And so, and then if it's, if it, is exceeds, maybe you don't want to spend it there. Maybe you want to take out a loan collateralized with that. So then, then you don't have to incur a capital gain right there and then just pay that off at a, at a future date. There's all kinds of ways that, that that can work. For someone who's really deep into it, uh, who has a financial strategy around living on crypto, I guess there's a lot of tools you could use. Uh, but for people just living the digital cash lifestyle, like a cash person, like um, it's basically intuitively if you're always earning it and you're always spending it the actual fluctuations of what you gain or lose just don't really matter that much i want to really dive into the logistics of this because i think about my own life and like if i was to try to live solely off of crypto there's all sorts of roadblocks of you mentioned Mm -hmm. paying bills there and i think from the electric company how am i going to pay that with crypto how are you doing this is it a lot of conversions that are necessary are you choosing to use vendors that only accept crypto can you really get into the weeds of how this is possible yeah so it's definitely changed a lot over the years because at first it was whatever i could find for bitcoin and then in the end of 2016 i couldn't really use bitcoin that feasibly anymore and so then i switched to mostly dash and then you know, of a few others in the mix and the options over the last, what has it been now, seven years almost has been, has changed significantly from day to day. And in fact, I made some video at the beginning of the year about how to live on crypto updated for 2023. And there's already a few inaccuracies, like a two months later that just like, oh, I have to like tell people there's a couple things that have changed there. Uh, But basically the thing is, there's a few different levels of this depending on who, how you want to, you know, live your life. Uh, it's, I would say remarkably easy to live on crypto. If you just go kind of like the crypto banking route sort of thing, where there's some kind of a big exchange that lets you have a balance in custodial balance in crypto. And then you have a card with them and then, you know, then you just pay for everything that way. That's pretty seamless, I guess, but also not ideal. Um, there's, if you want to go the next level of like ease of use, there's uh, a few companies around the world. And this used to be pretty much mostly in Europe. And then now the U.S. and Canada have some options as well that are uh, bill pay intermediaries uh, like Spritz Finance is the one I use are in the U.S. And it basically lets you just pay any bill with uh, with crypto. You just like add your bills and then you just hit pay. You send the money over and it gets paid you don't have to give them custody they're completely non-custodial you don't have to give them custody of your funds or anything and this whatever whether it's mortgage utilities anything like that i believe they're starting to make inroads into canada right now i don't know if they've had their whole service but then there's another one um, called bitcoin well which works in canada and it's worked since before spritz existed that also lets you pay all your bills so that's like the bill pay level they're swapping in Europe, for example. So it's pretty doable for a lot of the developed world to just 
pay bills. And so then you have, um, there's a plenty of different like prepaid cards you can get that you can top up with crypto. All this is non-custodial, but it does require giving up your ID or, or as they know, KYC. And if you don't want to do that, there are some intermediaries. There's a there, there's a lot of good uh, uh, gift card services. Uh, BitRefill is like the king of these, which basically lets you buy a gift card for any amount instantly with crypto, and they don't really require an ID and for nearly everything. And so, you, including you can get some prepaid like uh, bank card, like Mastercard or something like that without divulging your ID for a certain amount. And then you can use that to kind of fill in the gaps of everywhere else. And so that's pretty simple. At the next level, like the it can become a little bit challenging if you're trying to be completely peer-to-peer, but you can always... That's much more like groundwork of like a local community of like, hey, does my farmer take it? Let me do this. Let me find every site that does that. Let me, you know... Um, kind of do all that and the thing is um there is a there's a distinct community of people who are i would say bankless or underbanked and or by choice or not that has always existed and there's always these little tips and tricks that people have done to live cash only or whatever without a bank account and there's a lot of crossover with the living on crypto kind of people they just see crypto as another helpful tool for all this and uh, so, for example, you could do all of this without proving your identity, except for basically um, bill like big bills and taxes and things like that. And if there there are some people that you know live outside of that whole system, mm-hmm. where they just don't they don't really exist. They might not be in, in whatever country they're in legally. For example, they just and that's not a concern which is liberating to his extent because that's not a concern at all you just get to like everything you 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 get paid you get to just that's your money now you don't pay taxes on that because who's going to pay taxes a person that doesn't exist or shouldn't exist and then uh if you do the legwork to then say okay you're going to rent a room or a house from someone and you get to pay them in crypto and then they take care of all like their names on the bills and all these things like that but you have a an agreement you rent from them and pay them I've done things like that in the past. And so, yeah, depending on your situation, there's a whole lot of options. But um, it's basically, there's a lot, basically, it's pretty easy through a combination of um, bill pay services wherever you need to, and then gift cards and prepaid card services such as BitRefill. And then there's a whole bunch of other intermediaries that help. But then if you start adding in local merchants that you know that will take it directly, then that's when, then you get kind of the full experience. And that's the thing that um, we probably should be expanding over the next few years as like the the regulatory scene gets a little more brutal. So we don't have to, to worry so much about intermediaries. It's interesting how you break down the different kind of thresholds and like the different layers Mm -hmm. that you can do this to, has there been a time where you were ready to throw in the towel and you're like, okay, this is just too much of a pain in the ass to figure all these things out? Or has it just been, no, nope, I'm going to stick to it? Like, has there ever been a frustrating point where you almost were like, I can't do this anymore? Um, there were um, sort of two, I would say like one and a half, more or less. Uh, the one would be um, after towards the end of 2016 when I started to have a lot of hardship trying to use Bitcoin for this because I was using Bitcoin just fine. And then when the blocks started to fill up and fees started to get high, um, 2017 is when people think about for this, but I was much more living (laughs) as much, you know, for pardon my French, but much less full of shit than other people. And so I felt this a year earlier than other people where first off a lot of these services started requiring a confirmation before you could do zero confirmation for almost anything just oh they see it the you send the transaction it's broadcast to the mempool they pick it up they see it it's well it'll get into a block eventually it's very likely secure we'll just accept the payment but then when that started to become because of congestion issues but also some little thing called a replace by fee 
which was allowed to allow some Bitcoin transaction to then be reversed with a higher fee as a way to get at them unstuck in a congested kind of situation, but also meant that you're now the merchant. Well, that was much easier to then just re basically take the money away and steal their money. And so now all of a sudden you have to wait for one confirmation and that becomes very expensive. So like if you're trying to buy a $5 coffee and you can broadcast a transaction for 10, 15, 20 cents, okay, you could get away with that, but then it might be four hours for a, con for a confirmation. So and if you want the coffee want... shop waiting. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this actually happened. I mean, a few things I remember distinctly. Um, I was going to, um, I was going to another city about an hour away, and I was going to, you know, my wife had a work engagement. I like to, you know, I like to drive her with her to make sure because I kind of work from everywhere, and so I was like, I'm going to work from the coffee shop in that town today instead. And so I had a, a Wirex card back in the day before Wirex, you know, back when Wirex had like a a limit of like two thousand for total reloads before. You, they try to make you get ID and then you throw that card away and go for a different one, right? Back in that day. So I was, I wanted to go, I, you know, I had, I wanted to load some money so I could buy, buy myself a coffee and lunch. And I had like something like $5 on the card. And so I put some, I, I paid something like a 50 or 80 cent Bitcoin fee. This is 2016, right? To load the card, drove the hour away. And I got to the coffee shop, still had, didn't have a confirmation. So I just bought a coffee and I was there for several hours and I it never confirmed in time for me to have lunch. So I just didn't eat lunch that day, for example. <laughs> and another time um, I was trying to, um, again, I was trying to buy lunch or whatever. And um, the confirmation took so long to get a gift card to, to get an establishment that my phone battery actually died. And I just like, <laughs> just couldn't do it there. And another time I was trying to buy some new pants in the shopping mall. Same thing. I was walking. This is the earlier example, but I was walking around for an hour or two waiting for, you know, the confirmation before I could finally like go in and be like, Hey, I'm going to, now I'm going to do it. So these things hit my life for real. And that was frustrating. And, uh, I didn't like, I, I think that, um, especially if you go to like the, the Bitcoin maximalist side of, of the world, which why would you, but if you did, um, there's a lot of like, well, he just became a shit coiner at this point. And well, the question, the, the real thing is I, I hit a dead end in my noble goal, which almost every maximalist will say is a, is a, you know, is like the Nirvana is just no fiat. Right. And I, I could not continue feasibly. It was like, I, I reached a point of personal failure. And so I, that's when I had the crossroads of, do I just give up this experiment and just realize I was wrong? Or do I just keep trying to find a way to make it work, but then, you know, get out. And I was never like a Bitcoin maximalist out either. I always played around with other coins, but Bitcoin was what I used. And so I decided to try to use other things. And remarkably, it wasn't that difficult for like the first six months, or so like the end of 2016, early 2017, I was using a half, at least half of the same services with Dash as I was with Bitcoin, but I had to do that a shapeshift integration back when shapeshift was a centralized company where you could pay, even if the merchant only wanted Bitcoin, you could, or the service, you could pay with whatever coin you wanted that shapeshift supported and it would do a conversion. And so it was like a little bit of clunkiness for a few months, but then mid 2017 onward it's been just like super easy and i haven't really found a, a reason to try to like change anything up and um at the somewhere towards the end of 2020 or the end of 2020 2019 i should say um and i i worked full time for dash for what was it those two three years and then when i didn't do that anymore I kind of had a you know moment of reevaluation and just said, okay, well, uh, my decisions have facilitated me living off crypto pretty well. Um, doesn't seem like the the market is agreeing with my decisions because the prices are just not that good. And let me see, kind of like, what else am I going to do? And like, what else? And you know, then for the next few years, I've been doing like, you know, I've been 
building a company, doing all kinds of other work, all things like that. And at some point, of course, I always, it wasn't so much, I, I don't think I ever really considered going back to Fiat because I was, whenever I thought about opening up, it just repulsed me to like go back and start getting a bank car like everyone else. And I just didn't want to do that at all. And so that wasn't, that's what you would call the half thing. It's just, I'm, I gave an actual reevaluation of what am I going to like, what am I going to do for this thing? Not because I hit a brick wall, but because I just reevaluate just, and then it just came back of like, well, no, almost no one's still living on crypto. There's me and a few people. Um, the tools are today they're actually better than ever, but they're in a very covert kind of way. It's still not like a sexy thing where like everyone's doing it kind of thing or everyone's talking about it. And it's still the the thing where a lot of the world has sort of forgotten that um, some coins like Dash exist, yet somehow is still the f- fastest, best, easiest, best adopted kind of tool for living on crypto, in my opinion. There's like a few others that, you know, are in the vicinity, but it's still, and I kind of like hit by this, like, you know, this interesting situation. Like, why is that? Why, you know, part of it is because no one's living on crypto. It's just me and a few other guys. But the other thing is um, I should probably, it's probably up to people. Like, why am I sitting around waiting for other people? Like if, if this is, if this is what works and I've battle tested it for six, seven years, whatever it is, I should, it should be on me. I I have the responsibility for no one else using it a little bit, maybe. Maybe I should do a better job. And so that's kind of where I'm at today is um, I took a few years sort of off to just do other work and explore and learn a lot more about the crypto space as a whole and try a bunch of things and do all this stuff. But I think, especially with like a new bull cycle around, which I think might bring like an early early majority kind of adoption cycle where it won't be that weird to know someone who spends crypto. You know, everyone will know that one guy who like uses crypto around. I, I think that it's time to like push this as far as it can go. Yeah, I think we're at a point where, uh, like I said, adoption should be, at, at least should be a lot easier for you know, many more people to jump into from an actual, like using it in day-to-day life standpoint, than the challenges you had to go through, you know, back in 2016 and, and other times in the past. Um, but I'm curious, you know, you, you mentioned there dash multiple times and how that has been something that you adopted and sort of moved to as your, uh, primary crypto in 2016. And it sounds like still to this day, we haven't had the opportunity to talk to anyone on our show about Dash in much detail. And I'm Mm -hmm. curious if you can just break down what are the advantages of Dash? You know, why is that a crypto that uh, you feel suits your day to day needs as someone living fully on crypto? You know, what are sort of the the pros and cons of Dash and, and why should someone pay attention to it? Yeah, so I think there's three and just from the uh, the actual tool standpoint of like this gets the job done as far as spending it and using it as real money. There's kind of three big things. Uh, One is that um, technologically, structurally, it's instant transactions and really cheap. And once you experience that, like I, every once in a while I do something like I'll use some Bitcoin cash or I'll send some Litecoin or whatever. And I'm just like sitting around waiting. And I, I hate it so much. And I, it's it's the experience that sometimes I used to have, you know, many, many years ago. But like, I've been so spoiled by instant confirmations for everything that like nothing else really, really makes a difference. And there's always these quirks. Like I, I also use Zcash, which is, you know, fantastic coin, but they just not as primed for everyday transactions yet. Um, there's some quirks with like, for example, Monero, if you... You have some coins, you send them, you can't send it again for another few minutes because the change has to have a confirm for a few blocks before sending it for privacy. So there's like, and as soon as you're like, hey, let me pay you, oh, let me get this. And then you can't, when you hit that brick wall there, it's it's always on like unpleasant. So 
technically speaking, just you can send any amount to anyone anywhere and it just goes through right away for extremely cheap for fractions of a cent. And that's something that we should have with money. It's something that absolutely. And then you get some of like the nano people who are like, no, but this should be 100% free. Well, okay, but do you really notice? So technically, on the technical uh, side, there's that. On the practical side of adoption, as far as like fast, usable, instant confirmation, all that kind of stuff with some privacy functions, there's no coin that's better adopted than Dash as far as in all these services. Um, there's... Um, it's probably on the same level, maybe even a little bit better than Bitcoin Cash, although Bitcoin Cash is in different... It's like the adoption spheres are kind of like it's like a Venn diagram that overlaps, but it's like all these services only this and all these services only that. But um, you could say something like Litecoin is probably in more places and more services, but Litecoin also doesn't have the instant confirmations. And so as far as where you can practically actually use it, it has an advantage. And then the other thing is um, there's some a couple of special advantages. Uh, for example... The big thing, I think it's kind of um, underappreciated how easy to use and the official uh, wallets are, where um, I've used a whole bunch of different wallets, <laughs> like I would say hundreds or something. And I'm very, you know, I, I see the, of course, the the Edge shirt over there. I'm very good friends with Paul and I've told him reasons his wallet sucks. <laughs> Edge is great. I'm a very big fan of Edge. It's like my favorite multi-coin wallet. But I've there's a reason why I'd rather I have a separate app just for the Dash because that one's really easy. There's a way you can get to scanning a QR code without even opening the app. You just like long hold on the on the icon on your phone and then there's a QR code. You hit it and you can just so for practically spending in real stores and things like that, it's just so, so much easier. And also, um, for example, Spritz Finance, which is the uh, the bill pay solution, only as far as UTXO coins, it only accepts Bitcoin and Dash right now, not even Litecoin. So for that, it's like you're either stuck with so expensive Bitcoin or with Dash or, you know, then you have all your ERC-20 Polygon Arbitrum type things. But then those are more difficult to spend in other ways. So it's those three basic things is there's a few is it's structurally really fast and cheap and just works. Um, it's the native apps and integrations like that are just so much easier than just about anything else. And um, then it's actually well adopted along these services you'd actually use. So it's just like, it's just a lot of times I end up, if I get paid in something that's not Dash, I'll sometimes swap some over into Dash just because just works and so that kind of experience like the fact that 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 kind of experience exists in crypto which is it's still crypto you still have addresses which look all weird and they're still copy and pasting and they're still like every once in a while there's always friction but the fact that we're not pushing our best experience forward that we're like well I, I like the real bitcoin or some nonsense like that or like well the privacy is so great on this one that I'm going to use that one to then not pay for things because I can't, because I'm going to use fiat here. And just like, I think that we deserve to to push the best forward and make the best out there. And then just at least get someone. It's it's not like, it's not like it's like, well, I want one coin to win over other. I want any coin to win. We're losing right now. No one's using crypto for the most part to live off of it. Other than again, me and the other dozen guys I know of. No one's using this stuff. Let's get something that works. And so that's kind of like I have thought of before. What if I pushed something else? What if I was like, you know what? I'm going to become a Litecoin maxi or whatever. Or I'm just going to use Litecoin as the silver to Bitcoin's gold and push it forward. And I just knowing the services that are available, knowing the wallets, knowing the everything else, it just not nearly as inspiring as far as I don't have the confidence that I could tell people look look it's this easy just do this 
you mentioned there, there's about a dozen other people who are living a similar lifestyle and your pinned tweet right now documents this. You went out searching for others who are living the crypto only lifestyle and you were surprised by how many people you came across. What did you learn from those conversations? Were there others who also found Dash was, you know, the coin or the, you know, the, the best solution for them? Or did everyone kind of have a different strategy to how they made this work? What were those conversations like? Yeah. And so I found it. So myself and then two of those people were Dash people. Hmm. And then there's another friend local to me who doesn't lives completely unbanked as well. And he did not want to be on camera, but he's also, he's not like a, a hardcore, he's much more diversified, but he's as far as spending, he's like a Dash guy for sure. Like a hundred percent. And then there's a, a few Bitcoin cash people. That seem, and then a couple of Bitcoin people, which is, I think it's going to be a rarer breed these days. But it seems like there's a lot of information asymmetry in the space where people, um, where people get this idea of freedom and living off of crypto, they, they kind of grow where they're planted, wherever, whatever community brought them in, whatever community message to them, they're like, I'm going to get that. And I'm going to do that. And so with the Bitcoin cash, it's definitely worked out a lot for that because you're like, well, it's Bitcoin. Everyone knows Bitcoin, but this thing actually works. And all right. And then they start using it and they don't really run into serious problems with it. So it's just where they're at and it, it works fine for them. Um, and then you the, the thing that I get um, a little bit frustrated at, unfortunately, is the the Bitcoiner people, because I know a few of those that do live off of of. Bitcoin entirely. There actually there's a few of those. The problem is their ability to do so is so hampered by network conditions. Whereas you have an ordinal spike, all of a sudden you can't can't get your your transactions through, all your lightning services break or you're using custodial wallet that then gets deemed illegal in your country, which just happened with Wallet of Satoshi for example. And there's just so much like issue so many issues and like i've used phoenix right the phoenix wallet lightning wallet if you're going to use bitcoin that's probably the number one wallet you'd want to use because it's a self-custodial uh lightning wallet that actually has a decent user experience but so many people are still complaining about the user experience so why did i have to pay this giant fee just to receive some extra money and it's like well the channel wasn't big enough we had to expand it and then they rip their hair out um i i think that when you have people try to live all on Bitcoin and it works for a while and then it doesn't work. Most people don't do what I did. Most people don't look for a second option. They just stop. And that's a tragedy. I think that people, once you're out of the matrix, there's no reason you're going to get that, that, um, that virtual stake and betray your friends and go back in there. Like that's, that's crazy to me. So yeah, basically people grow where they're planted as far as whatever crypto community reeled them in and sold them. That's the tool that they tend to use. Uh, and then I do notice that most people either have a philosophical, I don't want to be controlled by the system, sort of freedom bent, or they have a very bad personal experience of sorts that caused them to not like the banking system. And then when they found an alternative, they just did that, which are kind of this, they're kind of different flavors of the same thing. And it seems like most people rely heavily on a few different intermediaries right now. And that's one thing that I think that in the early days of crypto adoption of you know, 2014 through 2017, maybe in 2018, 19, that era, um, you had a lot of individual merchants and things like that, that people would go and pay the owner directly, all this kind of stuff. The mom and pop shop merchant adoption scene, I believe, has receded over the years. There's fewer of those that accept it. However, it's easier to live off of crypto than ever because there's more uh, go-between services. There's, they're, they work a lot better. They've expanded. It's just so much easier to just be like, before I'd have to say, okay, look, get this wallet. I know this guy over here. He takes that. This guy over there. They, it, it takes forever. Now I can just say, if you're in the U.S., get a Dash wallet, get Spritz Finance for your bills, get bit refill for everything else, and you're good to go. And in Canada, it's the same way, except you might have to do um, 
what is it, Bitcoin well instead of spreads. And then you're still good. Just like two services, you can figure it all out from there. And I, that's beautiful. But I do think that we need to start amping up that that um, peer-to-peerness again. I'm curious on the in all the examples you've given around sort of the the different cryptos you might use to live your day-to-day life, I noticed that they tend to all have some level of privacy features that that's obviously important. But I'm also, you know, on the flip side, I haven't heard anything in regards to Ethereum or EVM uh, blockchains and uh or crypto tokens and i'm curious why that is like why why not anything ethereum is it because of the privacy side of things is it not as adopted when it comes to -to day-to-day spending and i and i also just want to tie in the reason i ask is because it's interesting ethereum as far as a network goes has probably the biggest DeFi space which DeFi is not for day-to-day spending, but it is, uh, you know, on the finance side of crypto. And there are so many very interesting uh, use cases in DeFi that you can't do in traditional finance that really do propel the finance space forward. Again, it doesn't necessarily tie back to day-to-day, but there's that heavy sort of... um, you know, part of the pie that is a, a big chunk of what Ethereum offers. So getting back to the question, you know, what are your thoughts on that? And why why do we not hear sort of uh, anything Ethereum related? Well, we do sort of. And so, for example, Spritz Finance, which is, you know, lets you live all on crypto in one simple app. It's really great. Uh, I first heard about them somewhere in 2020. 122 somewhere around there because they were running a brave browser ad campaign and it just said live all on crypto and i'm like this is just <laughs> you know and i just click and they launched polygon only like, like that's the only thing that they supported for paying all your bills and everything and then they expanded to all the other evm things and then they added bitcoin and dash later and it was kind of an afterthought because it was all a connector wallet and then just one click pay your bill kind of deal and the entire reason for that was of course because of uh because people get into DeFi, they make their gains they do whatever their financial stuff is and then they need to off-ramp those gains sometimes and it just becomes so difficult to be oh, i'm going to move to the centralized exchange trade it for this on oh, a bank account if you just pay right from your DeFi stash, that that's super simple. And it's kind of funny how like that world has really grown a whole lot where there's the DeFi world where it's kind of like the it's like the 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 regular crypto pay with crypto kind of world. DeFi is an afterthought. For the DeFi world, payments an afterthought, but there's some connections there. Um I guess the reason why you don't have people committing to like this whole living on crypto is their daily money a lot with Ethereum is first of all, Ethereum is nightmarish to use for fee type reasons. And uh, for the L2s, the L2s are a lot of time, I mean, almost every single one of them has some sort of admin keys or a multi-sig or some kind of like basically horrendous decentralization sin that makes people not want to rely on basically what is a company for their money rather than a decentralized network. So because of that, I don't think people feel really comfortable. Um, There is privacy on Ethereum if you know where to go. Um, For example, I'm a big fan of Railgun, which is a smart contract, which basically gives the cash level privacy, i.e. the top of the top of the top to anyone using EVM. But it just... You have to run a, you know, it's going to cost a lot of money to do that. And, you know, they're, that's kind of the reason. But so I, that is a very important thing to think about, though, is the DeFi world, because that's a one thing that keeps, you know, people from trying to live on crypto, I think, is that their whole financial world, not just their cash world, but their finance world is separate from crypto and DeFi kind of integrates that. DeFi is absolutely huge. That's one reason I am very, very, I guess, uber bullish, one could say about um, 
Thorchain and also the Maya protocol, which is the first fork of Thorchain, uh, because it adds this whole DeFi ecosystem to a completely cross-chain world. Where now, if you just say, I want to live on Litecoin or whatever, you know, and now you can actually earn interest on your Litecoin in a decentralized way through this. You can easily swap it for other assets. You could um you could get a, a a loan out of it too without having to do some wrapped thing or something on ETH. And so there's this giant world of like ETH and DeFi and NFTs like over here. And a lot of money is in there because people value it. They like it. They want to do something with it. And then there's the the decentralized money coin kind of thing here. And they just don't have like access to the finance side of things they think, or it's all shit coins over there, whatever they want to say. And so there's an impetus from both of those to have spendability. And the spendability just like, it's drawing in from both worlds, but not enough to really make a, a movement. And I think where you have combine those two worlds in a real way, which in my opinion, stuff like Thorchain does, because you don't have to do, you don't have to wrap and unwrap assets and all this kind of stuff like that. That kind of world is, I think, what we're going to see as a first um, as a first step to basically getting people to spend their crypto in all, some meaningful ways. And then, you know, if you have, then you can have all your ETH or whatever, whatever your your uh, DeFi stuff going on in the same wallet as you then with one click also using the same DeFi protocol to just swap for something like Dash that you can use in the real world. And yeah, that is like your, your checking account and then your savings account and investments and all this stuff, all that in one decentralized platform that a one decentralized, I guess, interface or connect connection of things. And I think that that's then that's what we're waiting for, I think, before we can really make this make sense to people. Joel, I'm curious. I had a recent situation. Thankfully, in the seven or so years I've been in the crypto space, this hasn't happened often, but it happened very recently, which made me want to... I just felt shame that I would make a, a rookie mistake like this. But situation where I was trying to send some ETH and I would copy pasted what I thought was my address. It didn't copy correctly. I pasted in somebody else's address who I had recently sent an NFT to. And then it was, for me, a significant amount of ETH. Boom, sent their way. Uh, still TBD if I'll get that money back or not, but that's fine. Oh, Anyways, they already spent it. It's gone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> let's yeah, hope not. Yeah. Let's hope. No, let's hope not. <laughs> Fingers crossed. We'll mm -hmm. see where it goes. Anyway, that's, again, the shame part is that I should know better, right? Double check, triple mm -hmm. check, all of those sorts of things. But for someone who has lived off of crypto, and I think a big fear a lot of people have with even the thought of that is by making a mistake like that, there's no there's no backup. Your bank can't cancel a transaction or anything for that type of solution. Has this type of situation happened to you? And if so, what's kind of the worst example of of you getting burned by that or have you been flawless throughout the years well i say i'm very grateful that i don't can't remember anything significant happening like that wow i don't know if i've lost well and part of it might just be my memory and things like that because I can't even count the number of hundreds of different wallets I have of different random cryptos that I've used over the years and dust of this random shit coin there or there. It's like probably somewhere in there, but I can't remember anything that I like remembered like, Oh, I'm missing that. I, there, I've had a few close calls where um, like I've had a, I've transferred from a different device and I'd be like, Oh, where's this? And I thankfully had my seed phrase written down or had some other times where a cup once or twice where I did, I thought I had my seed phrase written down. It was not. And I was like, Oh no, I was just ready to write off that money. But it turns out that I could get into the old hard drive and be like, open up the app on that broken phone and send it out in time and make sure it worked. So I had a few close calls, but mostly no, but that is a giant problem. If I would just, if I would say the two very biggest problems with crypto adoption for the mainstream today, are one, the address copying kind of thing of where it's just such a weird world where you can't intuitively send to people's like 
usernames. And th- one of the reasons why I got I chose to stay focused on Dash for many years in the beginning, especially, was this vision called Dash Evolution, which would do usernames and contact lists at the blockchain level. So you can actually just not have that experience ever again. And there's been some approximations with like ENS or unstoppable domains or something where you just have a simple static address resolver, but like to actually have it where you restore your seed phrase and then all your contact list is there of all the people and you just kind of interact with them like that. That's something that unfortunately the development on that for Dash has been extremely delayed um, to the, you know, ridiculously delayed even, but hopefully in the next few months, we can, we have something good to talk about on that front. But so there's that thing. But the other thing is the backup where if you have one wallet and you write down your seed phrase and you get a crypto steal with all those little steel plates and for like a, a backup of that, and you put that somewhere else. And then a few other things, I think that anyone who chooses to live their life on crypto should that should be very easy. But who who just barely uses this here or there has that level of security and who who has one seed phrase? Like everyone has I wouldn't I don't know. I mean, maybe they don't, but for me, I I have probably at least like a like a dozen for like random wallets here, there for this coin, for that coin, for this storage, for the the company here, for the other project there. It's just, and that stuff, like you take a paranoid person like me, maybe to, to get through that. The average person isn't going to, that's not going to work. And so for, I have contingent on the first thing, the username contact list thing. Um, I have an idea that hopefully if someone hasn't built this yet, they should of like a social recovery system where if you have a decentralized contact with a few different people, you can nominate um, a few of them for like a, a a recovery option to where if you lose your phone, you're like, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to get a new phone or new app. I put in my username and it says like, you know, all right, well, password or whatever and then you just you hit the recovery option you say all right i'm gonna do these three i'm gonna do my brother you know my best friend and my like lawyer i'm gonna enter their usernames and then they get a notification on their end and i just call them up and say hey by the way i just lost my phone i'm trying to use can you let let me back in and if like two of three of them say yes then you're back in some kind of a social recovery system like that i think is would really make people feel a whole lot better. And I think you could get people to be like, all right, you have to write down your words. Okay, whatever that you might lose it, but designate a few different people. And then I think that when they, you know, the cat eats through their seed phrase paper and then it can't read the words anymore um, and they lose their phone. Now I think that you can be like, all right, remember a username, we'll put it in designate the other people even if you forget their usernames you can call them up and be like hey what was your username again i lost my money sorry but the point is something like that i think could really help it out yeah you see um solutions like that here and there like i know argent wallet in uh on on ethereum does that exact has that exact system and and it's great the problem is there's so many different wallets for so many different cryptos and they all have different features most of them minimally so and it's like we need a wallet standard at some point that you know has all these great features that make usability so much better so that it's then you know followed in in all circumstances and that's and we can move like the whole crypto space forward in that in that way but um i do want to move on we're getting to the end of this interview and we've talked a lot about your experiences and the 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 challenges you've gone through um living this world of all crypto and um i'm curious What is your advice for someone if they're thinking of maybe making this transition and and, and adopting the same lifestyle? What would be your summarized sort of high level advice for that type of person? Well, my summarized high level advice is to try it out. You know, you're never going to know unless you try it out. Um, And 
I would just do a little bit of planning to where think of one repeat purchase that you do and start doing it with crypto. And so like, for example, if you have, if you do Amazon, why don't you, you know, let's just say download a dash wallet, download that refill. And then every time you go to Amazon, just buy an Amazon gift card for the amount and plug it in there and just do it. Everything else is normal. You just create that habit and it really just makes you feel like you could do something, you know, something good. I think a lot of people just get like overwhelmed and intimidated because it is a different world. There's a lot of different practices. There's especially when you start going in outside the safety of your own home to like out in the streets where you're like in you're checking out at the Home Depot and you want to buy an actual gift card for your lumber or whatever in real time. And then I don't know if your wallet's not synced or your phone doesn't connect or whatever. And then it's like, oh, shit, like you don't want to. That's more of a veteran situation. You know, you want to start simple with something at home. So some regular monthly thing, maybe even just get spritz and be like, I'm going to add one bill like my let's say my water bill. I'm going to pay my water bill of crypto every month and then just. You can do that. And then it's only once a month, which is frequent enough that you remember how to do it. It's rare enough that you're not like, oh, I got to like, this is my life. I got to like get on this and focus a lot of attention right away. And it just really lets you like, okay, this is cool. Well, I'm going to add some other bills. And then eventually you're just paying all your bills that way. And then it kind of grows from there. But just, you know, gain ground, take a piece of it, start using it, start practicing it. And, you know, welcome to the rabbit hole. It doesn't get any, it keeps going. It keeps going. <laughs> it's great advice. Joel, this has been an awesome conversation. As Alf said, we're getting close to the end of this because we like to ask every guest of Show Me the Crypto the same three questions in a little segment we call You Had Me at Crypto. So Alf's going to ask you those three questions. You ready? Yeah. <laughs> All right. The first question, who is your favorite person to follow in the crypto space? That's pretty tricky because there's so many people I could say. There's no like singular person to follow, but let's just say follow on X slash Twitter. Um, I would put out Justin Bonds at Justin underscore Bonds, who runs Cyber Capital. Um, and he's a good friend of mine, but also he's almost he's a like a very hard headed thinker who's always taking a big dump on all your favorite crypto projects, but like in a very point by point kind of a way. And it's definitely for if you think you understand crypto, it's a great place to go to because um, he understands it very deeply, very analytically, and he's not afraid to speak his mind and you're always going to learn something. And I don't I don't even agree with everything he says, but for everything, I learn a lot and it challenges, you know, my my. I guess, preconceived notions. It's definitely not if you... There's this kind of idea in crypto of like, oh, we got to get the newbies in. Let's get them into Bitcoin. And then we can't talk ill about Bitcoin because that kind of like... That's like the the first step in the rabbit hole. And then just... If you're that kind of guy, don't don't follow him. Because no, he's going to he's gonna burst all your bubbles. It's just like, if you want the hard, like mainline truth, you know, just shot of vodka in the morning, whatever, That's that's what you go for. I love that recommendation. I'll have to check them out. Uh, second question, what will the price of Bitcoin be 10 years from now? This is this is very hard because it could go a few different ways. Um, so let's see, we have the upcoming cycle. And then we have another cycle. Hmm. I really don't. I really have no real idea. I'm just going to say five hundred thousand, right? Just which is sounds very bearish to some people, but I'll I'll go with that for now. You'd be surprised. We've had all kinds of answers to that this year, from as low as I don't know twenty thousand to uh, a, mi- a million. Still, probably the most uh, common answer. But this year being bearish. It was, uh, we had a lot of low, low calls. We found the average. So the average during the bull market. So if we're talking, we launched this pod in late 2020. So 2021, 
1 million was the most common answer by far. And then over the last year, probably a hundred thousand is the most common. Yeah, so it really depends on lot. how the, how the market's doing. Yeah. Well, if you think about it, right, it's, we're talking about 10 years, which is five cycles. And we're talking about keeping on going up. So a hundred thousand seems to be pretty low for this bull cycle, considering past performance. Right. And then if you just count going up and up and up, 500,000 is actually like a, a down. The thing, the thing that people aren't like oh, 20,000, like, I don't really think that's realistic just on uh, fiat printing. Because 20, you're thinking t- today is 20,000. So like the 500,000 I'm predicting is probably like one to 200,000, mm. you know? Yeah, yeah. It could be, it's just, it's, little, it's for not some inflation. And yeah, yeah. So I think, I think that Bitcoin's heyday, it, it, famous last words, and feel free to bring this up later and roast me for being wrong, but at least I'm not pretending now. to be an expert. Yes, market. I don't pretend to be a, a markets expert. I just, I, I'm an expert at what I'm an expert in. Right. Yeah. But uh, I would say that, um, yeah, 100,000, you know, I think that Bitcoin's heyday is over. I think that, it's going to go higher this cycle than it has before and maybe the next one. And then it's going to be like tapering off and then either just, you know, flat or well, other things pump or, you know, maybe decline. I don't know. That's my, my feeling is this cycle and the next are the last ones where Bitcoin sees anything like, you know, continual appreciation considering all the other options. We'll tag you in the tweet in early December, 2033. See how you, See how you did. Yeah. Uh, See if I'm still alive or if any <laughs> Maxi sent a car bomb to my house by then. <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The third question here. And I do want to throw in a fourth at the end. But the third sure. question is, what is the most underrated project in the crypto space? That's a really hard question to answer because of a few different things um because like how underrated well one of the top ones would easily be dash because of the stuff i've talked about before um i would probably put the maya protocol in there too because it's a little bit less underrated just kind of more new but because it does everything that thorchain does but has some very interesting economics such as zero coin emissions and some like revenue sharing uh, opportunities, some other interesting things that I think makes it cooler than Thorchain, even though it's basically copying a lot of what Thorchain does. That's another one. Um, as far as like super under, like now we're going ones that are good, maybe not stellar, but they're just so down in the dumps that like, I don't know. So Beam is one. Beam is a Mimble Wimble coin, privacy coin. It's like one of the two big ones, Grin and Beam came out. Um, but Beam seems like a very solid project that now is like private DeFi and smart contracts and stuff. And it's got to be like page 10 of coin market cap or something like that. And the same thing would go for Firo, which used to be called uh, Zcoin, which is a privacy innovator. It's like on the level of, you know, Zcash and Monero as far as like the front lines of like coming up with new privacy tech and things like that. And it just also just lost in some far back page of coin market cap. But it's like no one even pays attention to these things, but they're they're really fascinating projects that I think are doing a lot of cool things. Nice. And it, no, I'm not saying buy the the token. I'm not. I don't own. I don't own those tokens because I don't expect them to catch on with the hype at all. So no, I'm not telling you to buy them. It just I think that they're cool, and unfortunately, they're far down the pages, and will probably stay that way. And this last question I really wanted to ask is just you know we've talked about you're you're in a unique situation uh i was we were saying before we hit the record button we've interviewed 126 seven people on this show and none of them are doing what you're doing you know it's a very small group of people who have made that leap and after everything we've discussed i just wanted to ask overall is it worth it like would you do it again if you were to go back is uh, you know is, do you ever think you know it's been fun but maybe it's time to go back to fiat oh uh, for me personally i would give it about as close to 100 percent worth it as you can get it just i 
it's a pain in the ass. It is what it is. But it's just like, I think it, it people probably get asked similar things about like, would you go back and have children again, knowing all this stuff? And like, they think about all the the hardships that they go through and stuff, but then, you know, ultimately it's, it's more than worth it. It's kind of the thing where the only way I could say it wouldn't be worth it, it, if I could somehow just erase my memory and become a complete sheep and just like never, like the thing is, once you know that this is possible, there's just no not doing this really. There's no, at least for me, if it's in reach, I just don't understand how anyone would do that. So, I mean, is it, freedom is one of those things that once you get it, it's like a, it's like high end alcohol where now you can't drink the cheap stuff anymore. You're just, it's ruined. You're done. Right. So once you get a taste of freedom in any kind of a way, whether it's working for yourself and not having a boss, whether it's being able to, to work from anywhere, whether it's free travel, whether it's just being able to having just enough financial security to where you can just on a whim go out to a restaurant and not worry about the price tag, whether it's you can freely carry, buy a firearm for cash. This is going to frighten the Canadians, but whatever. Freely <laughs> buy a, a firearm for cash from a friend. It's completely legal. Carry it open or concealed anywhere, including into the state legislature, and you're just fine and there's no problems. Those kinds of freedoms are super addicting. And once you get the freedom that you just, it's your money and no one can touch it. I mean, you can't give that up once you got it. So. That's why I warn people is like, careful before you start living on crypto. Make sure you got your life in order because this might get you down the rabbit hole and it might upend your life and your missus might leave you for being all weird, <laughs> whatever it is. Not, not, it hasn't happened to me, thankfully, because I, I picked right. But, you know, that's just what I say is just be careful because it could get addictive. Well, Joel, huge respect to what you're doing in the sense of, yeah, few people do this. A lot of people in this space, a lot of people pushing things forward doing great work, but to actually live it, to actually walk the walk is incredibly rare. And thank you so much for joining Alf and I on this episode of Show Me the Crypto. Thank Thanks you. for having me. Thank you for listening to Show Me the Crypto. Please make sure to subscribe as well as rate and review this podcast.